。下面有请《How to Raise Successful People》作者 Esther Wojcicki。Please welcome the author of How to Raise Successful People, Esther Wojcicki. I'm very happy to be here. Last time I was in Beijing was 25 years ago, and I want you to know the city has changed dramatically, and for the better. It's very exciting to see what Beijing has become. It's beautiful. I know all of you live here, and you're probably just used to it, but I'm seeing it for the first time in 25 years. So I'm going to talk about how to raise successful people, and this is simple lessons for radical results. So I've been teaching in California for 50 years, so half a century. Can you believe that? I was 2002 California Teacher of the Year. I'm founder of Palo Alto Media Arts Program. It's the largest media program in the United States, and I'm founder of the Journalistic Learning Initiative at the University of Oregon. This is my first book, published in 2015. It's in Spanish and in English. Moonshots in Education. It's also in Portuguese. This is my next book, the one that is coming out in China in 2020, the summer of 2020. It's already in 30 languages. Was published in the United States May 7th, and it's already a bestseller. This is the acronym that's in the book. This is basically what the book is all about. This is what I believe belongs in every classroom, in every relationship between parent and child, and between in all businesses as well. And it stands for trust, respect, independence, collaboration, and kindness. This belongs in all classrooms. Teachers should trust the students, respect some of their ideas, give them independence, allow them to collaborate, and treat them with kindness when they make a mistake. So the number one goal of the book is to empower your children, your children, to be successful in the 21st century. The 20th century was very different. We were focusing on obedience. The 21st century, we're focusing on. Creativity and innovation. Second goal of the book is to make all teachers great. Why do I want to do that? Number one reason: having a great teacher impacts a child in no other way. If all teachers can be great, all children can be successful. And the number three goal of the book—they're actually all the same—is help managers be more effective leaders. How can you be a really effective leader? It's the same things that come that are in in classrooms and in the home. So this is Mark Benioff. Mark Benioff is the CEO of Salesforce. This is what he said about my book, and it says about me, which is very complimentary. Every industry is clamoring for more innovators, more creative leaders who can solve problems with intelligence and a strong sense of social responsibility. Esther Wojcicki knows exactly how to instill these values in our children. We need her insights now more than ever. So my insights started with the birth of my children. This is how it started. I was a new parent. I was trying to figure out. What's the best way to treat your children? And I did not want to recreate my childhood. I didn't have the best childhood, so I wanted to do something special for my kids. And so I came up with this philosophy. Here are my three children. This is Susan, Janet, and Anne. This picture was taken in Geneva, Switzerland, where we lived for a couple of years. This is my husband, Stanley Wojcicki, professor of physics at Stanford. He was at CERN, the Center for European Nuclear Research, while we—that's what we were doing in Geneva. So these are my three daughters today: Susan, Janet, and Anne. This was taken at the Breakthrough Prizes in、um, Mountain View, California. 
So for those of you that don't know who my children are, I thought I would just tell you this method that I used on them worked pretty well. This is my oldest daughter, Susan, today. She's the CEO of YouTube. This is my second daughter, Janet. She's a professor of pediatrics at University of California, San Francisco Medical Center. Her focus is on the obesity epidemic worldwide. And this is my third daughter, Anne, founder of 23andMe, the largest personal genetics company. So everybody was asking me, like, what did you do with your daughters? So that was one of the reasons I wrote the book, because I wanted to tell people not only what I did with my daughters, but what I did in my classroom. My classroom, I have started with very few students and today have hundreds of students. My goal with my classroom, with my students, is empowering them, making them as innovative and creative as possible. So our world has changed dramatically from last century, and we no longer need to memorize as much. Why? Because we all have that wonderful phone in our pocket with an encyclopedia that where we can search pretty much anything that we want. But memorization is still the focus of school. It's still the focus not only in China, it's the focus worldwide. China scores really well on the PISA test. In fact, you guys are the best, number one in the world. So you're doing a really good job on memorization. However, one thing that we need to add to the, to the learning here is memorization isn't everything. Memorization isn't learning. After two weeks, students remember only 32%. So what we need to do is not get rid of memorization, but cut it back a little bit and see whether or not we can't enhance creativity. So there's an inverse relationship between test scores and creativity. The more students focus on test scores, the less creative they become. So parents today are really fearful, and the reason that they're really fearful is because they're all on social media, and they are all comparing their kid with the other kids, not just next door like they did years ago, but the other kids in cities far away, in countries far away, and they're worried that their child isn't actually going to measure up. So the main cause is really social media. So tiger parenting is the fear of mistakes. You're afraid to make a mistake. You don't want your kid to make a mistake. So you do everything you can to make sure that you do it for your child. So the 20th century needed very different things. It needed standardization. Everybody had to have the same skills, and it required obedience, because we were all working in factories. So we needed people that actually had certain prescribed skills. But today, we need creativity. And we need people who have skills that computers will never have. And these are the skills. Empathy, compassion, respect, kindness, creativity. Social, emotional skills. These are the skills that computers will never have. And we need to make sure we're teaching these. These are the top 10 skills that employers want, 2020. Notice number one, complex problem solving critical thinking, creativity, people management. I just want you to ask yourself, can you learn any of those by just listening to a lecture about them? Or by listening or by reading a book about it? Can you learn to be creative by watching someone else do it? You need to do these things. That needs to be part of student-directed learning projects that involve these things, projects that involve creativity. The number one skill employers want, this is it. So how do we prepare children to be creative? 
straight, what straight-A students are missing and getting wrong, if you always succeed in school, you're setting yourself up you're not setting yourself up for success in life in the 21st century because you're needing creativity. Preparation of talent has to start early in life. This is the child's first parent, first teachers, parents. All of you are the chi your child's first teacher. You might not think of yourself that way, but you should probably start thinking of yourself that way right now. Because kids learn the most from the parents. And they are much smarter than you think. In fact, what I would like to recommend that would be great here in China, actually great worldwide, is that all children learn a second language between the ages of zero and five. Why? They don't even have to study. They just, they're language geniuses. They learn how to speak another language really quickly. You are 96% less creative and less able to learn these things than you were as a child. If I had you com compete with a three-year-old to learn another language over one year period, I can tell you, you would lose. So habits are developed early and they're hard to change later. And early is small children. 85% of the brain is developed by age five. This is what Sir Ken Robinson says. He's the number one TED speaker. We're educating people out of their creative capacities. I believe this passionately. We don't grow into creativity. We grow out of it, or rather we are educated out of it. Many ways to enhance creativity. One thing, show the kids you respect them. Seek their opinion on things. They're very simple solutions. Give them the opportunity to lead. Let them plan a short trip instead of you planning the trip all the time. Encourage sports. Why? Sports, sports train grit, leadership, how to win, how to lose. Here's another one. Let them be bored. Check that out. Yes, New York Times even had an article, let children get bored again. Boredom teaches us that life isn't a parade of amusements. More importantly, it spawns creativity and self-sufficiency. Steve Jobs said why boredom could make you more creative. Boredom allows one to indulge in curiosity. Provide lots of free time. I know most parents aren't providing free time, whether it's here in China or whether it's in the US. Kids have something every day of the week, every activity. If it's one day it's chess, the next day it's piano, third day it's tennis. Play is the work of the child. Allow children to play. It's Maria Montessori, famous preschool. This is an example, just let them do it. Let them help cook dinner, for example. Okay, it's going to look like a mess, but they're going to be learning a lot. Don't be afraid of a mess. This is what it could look like. Let them clean it up. You know, this is just an example. So this is some of the things that I did in my home, and this is what I do. My classes don't look totally organized, I should tell you. You'll see them in a minute. Let them try new things. Why? Mistakes are part of it. A person who has never made a mistake, never tried anything new, Albert Einstein. It's what we need to do. So we stigmatize mistakes, and we're now running educa national education system where mistakes are the worst thing you can make. The result is that we're educating people out of their creative capacities. Stop comparing them. That's what we do. We compare them, and this is the first place we compare them. Is your child toilet trained yet? No one really cares, and I am sure that you've never asked your friends how old they were when they were toilet trained. So we can stop comparing them. Children are not pets. We can somehow compare them all the time. Your child is not your clone either. Okay, you are very, you're very different. Your child might be very different. 
Each child is special. Each child is a gift. It's our responsibility to nurture them. So how can you define success? Successful people feel empowered to follow their dreams. James Franco, the famous actor, said, she told, showed me I could take my dreams as seriously as I wanted. It's a quote from my first book. He wrote the introduction. Originally, he was going to be a mathematician. When he changed his mind and wanted to be a ma uh, an actor, can you guess how excited his parents were? Mathematician to actor, hmm, they were not quite so excited. Successful people believe in themselves. This is an example of successful people who believed in their dream. Successful people have a sense of control of their lives. Self-control, balance, calmness, determination, confidence. They have good relationships, good social emotional relationships. The three most important things in education are success, success, and success. There, those are the most important things. But relationships, 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 that is what leads to successful people. Relationships. Successful people are not afraid to think different. Here's Steve Jobs, not afraid to think different. Successful people are creative. Check this. He was not a great student, by the way. He hated school. This is Todd Rose from Harvard Graduate School of Education. Successful people have a purpose in life. Purpose, the golden ticket that money can't buy. Students learn purpose from projects they love. Students learn from people they love. Why Palo Alto, the city I'm in, has the highest concentration of unicorn founders in the world. Why is that? It's the education. We're following this model. Mastery system of learning. Mistakes are not penalized. You do it until you get it right. You write something, it's wrong, you revise it. You write it again, you revise it. You revise until you get it right. Same thing in math. You do it again until you get it right. Students have an opportunity to revise until they get an A. The program is based on trick, trust, respect, independence, collaboration, and kindness. The students are in leadership roles. They take control. So 1984 is when I first started. I had 19 students. I used a typewriter, X-Acto knives, and hot wax. This is what students were using to make a typewriter back then. I mean, a newspaper back then. This is my classroom for the last, for 30 years. I was in this classroom. And the program grew in this classroom. So what I'm trying to show you here, it's not the classroom that makes the program. It's what goes on inside the classroom that makes the program. Today, I have the largest media program in the US, 10 publications, over 700 students, and six media arts teachers. This is my new program. This is my new building, 25,000 square foot, Media Arts Center, the largest in the nation. So I went from that little classroom to this building. This is what the classroom looks like. This is a classroom in the building. This is what the class looks like. Notice students are not lined up in rows. This, again, is the furniture. It's flexible, movable. This is, again, what students look like. They're communicating peer to peer. It doesn't look like a classroom. It looks like a workspace. This is creativity. They're busy doing the th kinds of things they think are important. Here is another student busy working on a computer. More students working together. This picture was taken at 9 o'clock at night. Why was it 9 o'clock at night? Students never want to go home. They're happy. They like being there. This is the assessment. How do I assess? 
the student work. Every three sections, the top awards in the United States, number one in the country. This is what they produce. Newspaper looks like this, three sections every two to three weeks, all produced by teenagers. This is an internal page, what it looks like. Looks like a professional newspaper because I say you can do it. You don't necessarily have to do something that looks like it belongs in a high school. This is again, they do this. This is a, a mid midsection page. This again, bursting the bubble, Palo Alto. We live in a bubble. This all sort of front pages from all these different um, editions of the paper. You can see it on issue.com. Every six weeks, magazines come out, all done by students. This is all student graphic design, sports magazine. This is another magazine. This one had is about the tragedy that we had with uh, the shooting in Florida. Focus is on creativity. Peer pressure keeps the students motivated. They collaborate. It's real world learning. And here's a few of the graduates. Not all of the students went into journalism. Look at this. This is my former student, Jeremy Lin, the basketball player. So he believed in his dream. This was his dream, and he followed it. Lisa Brennan Jobs, Steve Jobs was a parent in my program. She wanted to be a journalist. She wrote a book. Gotti Epstein, he is the economist, works with the economist. He was in charge of the China Bureau for the Economist for years. Brian Wong, he's vice president of the Alibaba Group. And so this is my latest endeavor. This is Moonshots in Education. This is my attempt to spread this type of philosophy worldwide. Trick, trust, respect, independence, collaboration, and kindness for all students everywhere in the world. This goes against the traditional education program. If we can just do it 20% of the time, 80% can be traditional, 20% give students an opportunity to control their learning. That will make a difference for everybody, for the future of education. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Esther Wojcicki, for the Thanks for your insight, for sharing, Ms. Esther Wojcicki.